Welcome to the welcome to the uh, latest installment of the book of Genesis, and I hope uh, you and I can learn something together here. I'm pretty darn sure we can. We had uh, looked at the um, successful attempt of Abraham to find a kindred wife for his son Isaac, and they had a joyous uh, blind date uh, when we last left them. And this is kind of it for good old Abe. And uh, there are plenty of other stories about him that are contained in the uh, the uh, Jewish writings, the uh, Haggadah, with the, the story, edifying stories about the patriarchs and so on. But this is, uh, including one of my favorites that illustrates uh, certain principles of interpretation that still obtain today in many religious communities. Two rabbis are... Uh, discussing uh, the practice of wearing the skull cap, the yarmulke, and uh, one of them feels a little uh, insecure about the fact that there doesn't appear to be much scriptural, ex explicit anyway, scriptural support for the practice, where the other one begs to differ, and he says, take a look at this passage right here, and I look up Genesis 12, and says, and Abraham went out from there, <laughs> well, you see, the guy says, I don't see anything about a yarmulke there. And he says, what do you think Abraham would go out without a yarmulke? <laughs> oh, well. Uh, anyway, um, uh, let's uh, get Abe off stage here uh, with um, a little priestly genealogy material in chapter 25, starting with 7. This was the total length of Abraham's life, 175 years. You notice he comes in under the wire, established the deadline for lifespans established before the flood by a God in Genesis 6. Yeah, so Abraham came to his death, dying at a ripe old age. An old man satisfied with life or full of days, as the King James says. You know, you wonder if he'd have thought that if he knew uh, that he had uncles that had lived a whole darn millennium almost. Uh, uh, not cut off in youth. Anyway, he was gathered with his fathers, in other words, buried. His sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, which faces Mamre, the field which Abraham had bought from the Hittites. If you remember last week's exciting episode, there Abraham was buried along with his wife Sarah. After the death of Abraham, God blessed his son, Isaac, who made his home close to Berlahiroi. The following are the descendants of Ishmael, or these are the generations of Ishmael, the son of Abraham, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. The following are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, Ishmael's firstborn, Kedar, Abdil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedema. These are the sons of Ishmael. These are their names as arranged by villages and encampments. Twelve princes arranged by peoples. Were they actually the sons of one man? Forget it. They assembled together as an Amphictyon, a twelve tribe league. The word Amphictyon means those who live around something. And so they sealed the deal of their alliance, their confederation, by saying that they were all the sons of one man. You can tell some of these are not even personal names, like Nebaioth. Uh, that's a plural. Ooh, some of these are interesting, though. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Masa, there's a, an Arab king who contributed some of the Proverbs, of the book of Proverbs, Lemuel of Masa. Hadad, that's the, the name of Baal Hadad, which means they were worshippers of him. It was a Canaanite storm god, very much like Yahweh. Tima, I assume that's the same place that Eliphaz the Temanite was from. And it's interesting to just compare notes on these things. Uh, this was the length of Ishmael's life, 137 years. So he came to his death. He died and was gathered to his fathers. Then a little 
note from J, sandwiched in, verse 18, he inhabited the region from Havilah as far as Shur, which is on the border of Egypt, in the vicinity of Asher, having settled on the outskirts of all his kindred. That's that's there to sort of fulfill this thing we saw, this prediction when Ishmael was first introduced, that he would live over against all his people and be a wild asshole, a wild ass of a man that no one could get along with. Okay. If you're thinking to yourself, well, that's those Arabs. They can't get along with anybody. I guess the Bible is true. Hallelujah. Well, I don't know if that is true of all Arabs. There are certainly people in every group that are a little tough to get along with, right? And those are the ones you notice if you're the one not getting along with them. Uh, but, of course, it is clashes like that that led to this characterization by way of a sweeping generalization of the Ishmaelites or the Ismailis, as you'd say in Arabic. Well, then... Verse 19, back to the priestly source, the following are the descendants, or these are the generations of Isaac, or Yitzhak in Hebrew, boy, I like the sound of that. The son of Avraham. Avraham was the father of Yitzhak, and Yitzhak was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Pat and Aram, and the sister of Leban, or Laban, the Aramean. So there's more priestly statistics, and then we go back into uh, narrative uh, from J. We like such things in verse 21. Isaac besought Yahweh on behalf of his wife because she was barren. So Yahweh yielded to his entreaty, and his wife Rebekah conceived. While in her womb the children jostled each other, or one might translate wrestled together, in the Septuagint, it says leaped together, which is where Luke got the notion that John the Baptist leaped in utero when the pregnant uh, Mary entered the room. I think this is uh, based on this story and therefore a piece of fiction. Uh, let me just, well, since I'm paused on that, um, how did she suddenly become unbarren? Well, you might wonder if in the background here there was the visit of a certain doctor angel, some man of God who uh, impregnated her. Uh, who the heck knows it doesn't say as it does in some of the others. But one way or another, his prayer was answered. Perhaps that way is tactfully omitted here. Okay, well again, 22. While in her womb the children jostled each other so that she said, If it is to be thus... On whose side am I to be? Or one can, one can translate, why am I still alive? You know, this is too much. Remember the thing in uh, J in the Garden of Eden, in pain you shall bring forth children, on exhibit A. Okay, but here, uh, uh, Meek translates it, I've got competing offspring in the works. I'm going to have to choose sides. I wonder which one it'll be, and we will shortly find out. Well, of course, you know, it's Jacob. And so that's, uh, that's the one on whose side she is going to be. Still in verse 22, So she went out to consult Yahweh, and Yahweh said to her, Now, how do you do this, and where'd she go? Well, I don't mean to suggest there's something absurd about that. I just it assumes certain things it doesn't tell us, and I'd like to bring them to, you know, about the threshold of notice. My guess is uh, that um, she goes to a sacred grove like that of Mamra or any of these things, uh, and and uh, there asked the attendant priest or Kahim, soothsayer, or she may have just gone there and slept on the ground at night, and Yahweh spoke to her in a dream. Who knows? It could have been anything. But uh, there, uh, it's like going to a you know a doctor for medical advice. There were people you could go to, places you could go, and she did. So uh, here's uh, what uh, here's the interpretation. Yahweh said to her, Two nations are in your womb." and the two peoples have been hostile ever since conception in you. The one people shall master the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Why is part of that in, in the past tense? 
Well, because in Hebrew, believe it or not, there is no past versus future. There's the present, I'm sorry, there's the perfect tense and the imperfect tense, and the imperfect can imply past or future. So usually, translators render this as a future, which would make a lot of sense given the narrative standpoint um, that um, Rebecca is uh, receiving an oracle as to what is to happen in the future from her standpoint. But from the reader's standpoint, it's already happened, and that's the point of this thing because it's one of those ethnological stories, right? So really, it's kind of clever of Meek to translate it uh, with the past. Two, again, two nations are in your womb, and the two peoples have been hostile ever since conception in you. The one people shall master the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Uh, two peoples, who are they? Well, these two are to be the eponymous, mythical, symbolic ancestors of, um, of course, Israel and their old enemy, Edom. And uh, we'll follow up on that in the next verse, 24, still in J. While the time of her delivery came, they were in, there were indeed twins in her womb. The first one was born red, his whole body like a hairy garment. So his name was called Esau, or Esau, which might mean hairy. Uh, he certainly described that way. And, of course, that marks him as what? A sun god. Probably a sunset god, given the, the red also. But here, the myth has turned into legend. He is a mythic or legendary culture hero and eponymous ancestor, and he's going to be described like a caricature of the Edomites, the way the Israelites um, picture them. And then we have uh, his uh, brother Jacob, who was seen in the self-flattering terms of the storyteller. Then his brother was born with his hand gripping Esau's heel so that his name was called Jacob, which means actually heel gripper or supplanter. Why would he grab somebody's heel? Well, of course, to slow him down in a race. Uh, not so fast. Uh, Isaac, was, Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. Uh, the boys grew up. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob became a man of peaceful pursuits, making his home in tents. How many tents did he need? Well, they're jumping the gun to say, as they said way back a few chapters, that, uh, what was it, uh, Jabel was the father of those who dwell in tents, nomads. Well, that's what he is, and that's what Israel is pictured as being. So he symbolizes them. Uh, whereas the Edomites are outdoor folk, hunters, and um, sleeping under the open sky and not hurting but uh, killing animals to eat and so on, shooting them down. I, verse 28, Isaac favored Esau because he was fond of game, <laughs> while Rebekah favored Jacob. <laughs> this is pretty crass. I, the whole notion, uh, of which they were not naive, of the parents lining up behind rival favorite children, <laughs> well, as great prophet uh, George Costanza would say, <laughs> what a disaster. Uh, oh, man, you're asking for trouble. Is the Bible teaching us about family structure? Well, yeah, it kind of is. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear the writer knows he's showing you a real bad example. Uh, and that's the way the Bible deals with polygamy, right? It never outlaws, not even in the New Testament, when it was still being practiced. But it does kind of show the problems that happen in all polygamous societies with rival wives. So is this a teaching? Well, kind of a subtle one. There's no commandment there, but, you know, we're going to see, uh, <laughs> you know, don't do this. Or, well, the note, why is um, Esau, if he's the symbolic ancestor of the Edomites, not called Edom? Well, he used to be. You may remember this theory from a week or two ago. Uh, you, 
and based these names on collections of consonants that anyone have written vowels. The consonants are what matters. The name Edom is the same as Adam or Adam. That was the father of the Edomites. But somehow that story became so popular in Israel that they just made him the first man supplanting their own indigenous myth of a first man, Enosh. Uh, and so they had them both in there, one superfluous. And uh, so they already used him, and they're not going to give their rivals, the Edomites, the honor of saying that their direct ancestor was the ancestor of the whole human race, Adam, Adam, Edom. Uh, no, so there has to be a more proximate ancestor on the same level with our Israelite ancestor, Jacob or Yakub. Uh, so, uh, so they call him Esau and draft into service a sun god, the red, hairy Esau. So that's why there's been a little switcheroo. And the same sort of thing has happened, though I'm not so clear as to why, in the case of the eponymous ancestor of the Israelites. They're the sons of Jacob, who is lately and barely given the, the extra name Israel. That sort of implies that these people weren't originally called Israel of some other character who has been blended with this one. Oh, what a mess. I mentioned to you the theory of Albrecht Alt, uh, the gods of the fathers, uh, that uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were fused together by way of political links between groups of tribes that federated together. And the one with the greatest seniority uh, was Abraham and uh, he was uh, made the grandfather and then uh, below him there was Isaac and Ishmael and below them Jacob and Esau well doing some reading and uh, turns out that there had been another Israelite tribe uh, up north called Raham and Abraham means father of Raham so uh, he may have begun as this this other elder tribe that petered out, as a couple of these did too, later on, Simeon, for instance. Uh, but anyhow, uh, they're, they're, uh, it's pretty clear who's supposed to represent whom, even though these two guys don't really have the, the common names of the groups later said to be descended from them. Jacob, of course, the father of the Israelite tribes, fictively, and Esau, the father of the... Um, the Esauite tribes or the Edomite tribes. We'll get a list of those a little later too. Alright, so uh, we have the father doesn't necessarily know best premise of the next story given us here in J in Genesis 25 28. Uh, still in J uh, and, and oh yeah, I, I said how the uh, the parents have divided over the kids and what's so ludicrous about it is that it's just over food. Right, that uh, uh, that Esau goes and uh, shoots these critters and makes savory stew, and his dad likes that. So the other kid, uh, the hell with him, who cares what he's doing? You know what what uh, awards he's winning in school? Well, the hell with him. I'm, I'm just interested in a good meal. It's incredible, right? But uh, there are people just as stupid. Needless to say, the story is also way oversimplified because we're going to need to know this particular preference of uh, savory game and the provider thereof in the eyes of, um, of old Isaac. So maybe, you know, they're not really thinking about how ludicrous this sounds as a family policy. They're just telling you what you need to know for the story to come out the way it has to, and I guess that's the fair way of looking at it. And then we're going to see that rubbed in twice when we have a couple of versions of the same thing. Now, what is this about the one being older than the other and supplanted by the other? Well, it, this probably means that at some point in, the, in their history, Israel and Edom made some kind of a bond together and figured that they had to be um, related because of that. And most people think, I, I believe from what I'm reading, uh, that uh, the uh, Israelites had uh, taken over and moved in and, and 
it was just a population shift, and uh, were, there were more recent residents in the same area. There was no conquest, nor does this uh, presuppose one, right? This, this whole thing is like an alternate way of accounting for the later population in Canaan, an alternate to a conquest. That's a much later notion. This notion that, no, the one nation is just older than the other, and they've always been here. No conquest. It's just like several of those stories in Genesis 4 and 5 presuppose continuity with the present. No flood interrupting the whole thing and ripping the fabric of the story. Same thing here. No conquest in the offing. Um, so, uh, okay, now we... Uh, we We've got the two nations, they're related, the one is older, but the other succeeds. And that's what people figured needed an explanation and therefore a legitimization. And that's what we got here, an ethnological story, a couple of them. In verse 29, once when Jacob was making a stew, not, not a row, right, a stew over something, but he's actually in the kitchen, the next Food Network star, uh, Esau came in from the fields famishing, whereupon Esau said to Jacob, Let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famishing. That was how his name came to be called Edom, which means red. What? His name is Edom? Well, yeah, we're just not going to call him that, and I've already explained why because that's the first man created in the Garden of Eden, and we don't want to identify him with this guy, but we do want to identify this character as the father of the Edomite ethnic group, so we do have to mention it, just to make it clear. Uh, and um, so he's called Red. Remember, Adam is also Red Earth, same, same name. Uh, well, is that really why? <laughs> Because he asked his brother for some a ladle full of tomato soup? Well, nah. It's one of these uh, kind of entertaining, uh, silly etymologies. So that much of it is an etymological story. But old Jacob is pretty shrewd indeed. Uh, he's pictured that way on purpose, right? This is the self-flattery of the crafty Israelite. Now, don't think I'm using some sort of uh, anti-Semitic slur that Jews are money grubbers or anything. That's, that's a lot of baloney, you know. But, but of course, there, there's a justifiable reference to uh, financial pursuits among Jews because they were relegated to that by Christian Europe, right? Uh, the Christians, for whatever reason, couldn't... Um, practice banking with interest and they couldn't have money lending but they needed people to do it so they forced Jews into that role well apparently the same kind of thing had happened before especially since Jews got exiled and one thing they could do in a foreign land like Babylon was to engage in trade a lot easier to do that than farming in a foreign land so please do not you know, saddled me with that. I'm just suggesting that, to some degree, these stereotypes uh, already existed because of the uh, the exile, which is in the past of the storytellers here. Okay, so he's make, making a shrewd deal because uh, poor Esau can't control his hunger and is uh, in need, he thinks, of immediate gratification. So what's the deal, verse 31? Uh, first, sell me your birthright, said Jacob. So Esau said, and boy, is this a great rationalization. Haven't you thought stuff like this? Here I am at the point of death. So of what use is a birthright to me? At first, uh, give me your oath, said Jacob. So he gave him his oath and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob then gave Esau bread and stewed lentils. <laughs> it hardly seems worth the deal. Sorry, yeah. Uh, he ate and drank, then rose and went away. Thus lightly did Esau value his birthright. What a, what a dope, right? Well, that's the way they pictured uh, the, uh, the Edomites, a bunch of dopes. Uh, this is ethnic slur time, right? They did not like the Edomites much, and we'll see why later. Well, you know how the letter to the Hebrew 
Jews later on refers to this as terrifying threat that if one breaks the seal of baptism by a single sin, oh, you're crucifying the Son of God anew and you have no prospect except to fall into the fiery hands of a vengeful God. Uh, well, pretty scary stuff based right on this. Just like, don't be so stupid. The writer of the Hebrews says, don't be as stupid as Esau who sold his birthright, a primogenitor, the lion's share of the considerable riches of their father. I don't, I don't really care about that. I just want to fill my stomach with lentil stew. Yeah, well, okay. Um, then 26 begins, chapter 26. We've already looked at that. It is... Uh, another version of the lion patriarch business. And uh, since we have looked at it, that's enough of that. Uh, and um, stoppage of the wells and all that business. Uh, so I, that grew a bit tedious and I uh, am not uh, eager to go through the whole thing. Rather, I'd like to speed ahead to... Um, Ooh, uh, let's say the end of the chapter, verse 34. All of this is uh, the story we're, we're skipping because we've looked at it before. Well, that was a J story, but here's a little bit of statistical fodder, filler. In verse 34 from P, when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, uh, the daughter of Beery, the Hittite. <laughs> Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Uh, and uh, Basimath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they were a source of distress to Isaac and Rebekah. Probably because they're always borrowing money and they show up uh, to eat and be tough to get the heck rid of them. Um, get back to Jay and the beginning of chapter 27. Another version of how um, the... Uh, priority of the older culture was sacrificed to that of the younger. And boy, this is great. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. We did go over this another time, uh, but it's so good we can't skip it. This is a classic ethnological story. 27.1 and J. One day, when Isaac had become old and his eyes so dim that he could not see, he called his older son Esau. Okay, remember, Isaac is the non-hairy one. He's the moon, whereas uh, Esau, the hairy one, is like the sun with its rays. Well, when the, the moon, well, actually you could say when either of them would be old and on the deathbed, the light would fail, right? That's part of the mythic symbol. Well, here's, here's Isaac, the, the moon god. And uh, let's see. Is, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, Isaac, they're, they're both sun gods, but they're different parts of the day. Uh, he who sits in the heavens laughs, that's Isaac. That's like the noonday sun high in the sky. The red sun is the sunset, hence older. So they're, they're competitors. And so, if they get old, they're both going to have uh, uh, less light. That's what we've got. All right, so one day when Isaac had become old and his eyes so dim that he could not see, he called his older son Esau. My son, he said to him, here, I'm sorry, I can't get this straight today. I don't know what's the matter with me. I guess I'm one of those dumb Edomites. Um, yeah, uh, Isaac is the sun. So is Esau. Jacob is the moon, the smooth man, yes. Right, but uh, it is not Isaac and Esau that are in conflict. They should be on the same page, as indeed they are. Right? Okay, um, my son, he said to him, here I am, he replied. Now, why does he have to say that? Well, biblical characters often say that. Eh? Reporting for duty. But but here, it, it's a little more than that because his father is pretty darn blind. It's like he's saying, are you there? And yes, yes, Dad, here I am. He said, 
here I am, an old man, not knowing what day I may die. Uh, get your weapons then, your quiver and bow, and go out into the fields and hunt some game for me. Then make me a tasty dish, such as I like. I, I like the way the RSV has it, a savory dish. And bring it to me to eat, that I may give you my blessing before I die. Last meal request, right? I, I may be dead tomorrow. I sure wouldn't want to pass on without one of your special... Uh, Meals. Think you could go make me one, and, and then I will give you my blessing. That's like putting you in the will, basically. I mean, the deathbed blessing meant something. The good wishes would happen, supposedly, just like a curse would really get you. They believe these words had power. Otherwise, what's the point? Well, we still do it, and we don't really expect anything to happen. Yeah, but that's just a degeneration of an older custom that once did mean something. Right, 27.5, still J. Now, Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when I, Esau went off to the fields to hunt game for his father, Rebecca said to her son, what is it, not their son? Well, her favorite son, of course it means. Said to her son Jacob, I just heard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game and make me a tasty dish to eat that I may bless you before Yahweh before I die. Now then, my son, obey me and the charge that I give you. Go to the flock and get two fat kids for me there. Not not the fat kids we have in school today, right? Uh, nice plump goats, young goats. And that I may make them into a tasty dish for your father such as he likes. Then you shall take it to your father to eat that he may bless you before he dies. Oh, pretty conniving. And Jacob said to his mother Rebecca, Ah, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I am smooth. Suppose my father were to feel me. I should look like an impious person to him and bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. Let any curse for you, my son, fall on me. His mother replied, Only obey me and go and get them for me. This guy is no dope, right? He sees trouble of brewing. He said, Mom, we're never going to get away with this. He's going to curse me. Um, and she said, Look, uh, I'll stand in line to take the curse. What? How does she know that? Well, I guess they figured you could send them or retract them, like unsend on your email. Um, uh, not criticizing the story, that certainly is what they were thinking right, when they did stuff like this. And um, so uh, they have to assume that the father is not going to know the difference between goat meat and, uh, let's say, venison. Would you? Would I? I don't know, but I suspect one would if one were used to such uh, feasts. But maybe the old guy, uh, maybe they think he's dimmer than he is. Um, all right, verse 14, So he went and got them, and brought them to his mother. His mother then made a tasty dish, such as his father liked, taking the best clothes of her son, of her older son Esau, which she had in the house. Rebecca dressed her younger son Jacob in them. She put the skins of the kids on his hands and on the smooth parts of his neck, and committed the tasty dish and bread which she had made uh, into the hands of her son Jacob. <laughs> uh, then he went into his father and said, Father, yes, he said, uh, who are you, my son? Uh, in other words, which one are you? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I, I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat once more of my game that you may give me your blessing. <coughs> but Esau said to his son, How did, however did you come to find it so quickly, my son? <laughs> really? Uh, because uh, Yahweh, your God, uh, brought it in my path, he said. Yeah, that's the ticket. Isaac then said to Jacob, Come up close that I may feel you, my son, to see whether you really are my son Esau or not. That's some kind of a prank. Um, so Jacob went up to his father Isaac, who felt him and said, hmm, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are those of Esau. 
Hence he did not detect him because his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed <laughs> what was he saw like the wolf? Uh, what was this, what is this planet of the apes? Uh, that he's got sh <laughs> shaggy fur on his hands and wrists and neck? Well, this is storytelling, not history. Uh, so he blessed him. Uh, but he doesn't quite do that yet. He's still got a little more uh, suspicion to exercise the guy's not so stupid are you really my son Esau he said verse 24 I, I am he replied so he said bring some of your game to eat my son that I may give you my blessing so he brought it to him and he ate he also brought him wine and he drank then his father Isaac said to him uh, come here and kiss me my son another test so he went up and kissed him, and when he smelt his clothes, he blessed him, saying, Ah, my son's smell is like that of a field that Yahweh has blessed. Okay. May God give you of the heaven's dew, of earth's fatness with plenty of grain and wine. Nations shall serve you, and peoples bow down to you. Be master of your brothers, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be they who curse you, and blessed be they who bless you. No sooner had Isaac finished blessing Jacob. Uh, indeed, Jacob had just left the presence of his father Isaac when his brother Esau came in from his hunt. He too made a tasty dish and brought it to his father. Let my father sit up, he said to his father, and eat some of his son's game that you may give me your blessing. <coughs> And who are you? His father Isaac said to him. I'm your son, he said. You're firstborn, I'm Esau. Thereupon Isaac was very greatly agitated and said, uh, Who was it then who got some game and brought it to me? I ate heartily of it before you came and blessed him so that he is indeed blessed. On hearing his father's words, Esau cried aloud and bitterly and said to his father, Bless me also, my father. They said, Your brother came under false colors and stole your blessing. <laughs> is it because he is named Jacob that he has now twice got the better of me? A little editorial harmonization, obviously. It's two versions of the same altercation. He stole my birthright, and now he has stolen my blessing. Yeah, pretty much the same thing. Have you not kept the blessing for me? He added. But Isaac, in reply, said to Esau, since I have made a master over you and have made all his brothers his slaves and have provided grain and wine for his, his sustenance, what then is there that I can do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. When Esau lifted up his voice, no, whereupon Esau lifted up his voice in weeping, so that his father Isaac complied and said to him, Away from the fat of the earth shall your dwelling be, away from the dew of the heavens on high. That's just the opposite of the blessing he gave Isaac, thinking he was given to this clown. By your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. Uh, well, that's pretty much the way it once read, but someone has added... But, though, you, when you become restive, you shall break his yoke off your neck. Okay, you can tell that was added in because verse 41 um, follows right from the middle of verse 40, not the end of it. So Esau had a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing which his father had bestowed on him. It will soon be time to mourn for my father, Esau said to himself, and then I will slay my brother Jacob. But Rebekah was informed of the designs of her older son Esau. And he apparently didn't make much of a secret of it, right? Um, and so she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Here is your brother Esau threatening to take revenge on you by murdering you. Now, my son, listen to me. Uh, that's a great idea. Huh? They did that before. Well, listen to me. Flee at once to my brother Laban at Haran and stay a while with him until your brother's anger subsides. 
until your brother's wrath against you relents and he forgets what you've done to him. Then I will send and fetch you from there. Why should I be bereft, be bereft of both of you on the same day? That implies her husband has died. And so now Esau feels free to say, where is that little creep? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm squaring things with him. Where is that little bastard? Uh, and his mom's saying, all right, get out of here. Uh, and so you, you can just hear him saying, Mom, <laughs> this is just what I told you was going to happen. And I don't see you bearing the curse. It's me he wants to murder. Right? You can almost imagine that happening. Uh, um, so uh, he's going to take it on the lamb. A uh, little historical background here. How is this an ethnological story? Well, I've already said the characters stand for for uh, you know the, the tribes of Israel, the tribes of Edom, respectively, and so on. What about the enmity, and what is it that the second half of verse forty is predicting? Well, it. It was added when the fortunes and the relations of Israel and Edom were reversed. So somebody figured this original blessing and cursing really defined the relationship between Israel and Edom as they were for a long time and should have stayed that way. After all, these words have power. But, uh, gee, what do you know? Edom uh, reasserted its priority successfully. Well, I guess we'd better update the prediction then. Now, what am I thinking of? Well, there's a couple of psalms that are uh, interesting in this regard. Uh, one of them is Psalm 2, one of the most interesting of, of psalms, the coronation psalm. And uh, it depicts the perhaps imaginary empire of David and Solomon with all these little buffer countries absorbed into it but the way the Bible tells the story though David dragged them into his orbit kicking and screaming Solomon was much more concerned about interior decorating and let them go their own way so they broke loose but this psalm considers that the possible rebellion of these uh, conquered lands and laughs it off perhaps a little too nervously why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain the kings of the earth stand up and the princes also take counsel against Yahweh and against his anointed saying let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us he that sits in the heavens laughs. Adonai makes sport of them. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. I indeed have anointed my king on Zion, my holy hill, and so forth. So they laugh at the idea that the Edomites and the Moabites and these guys might want to regain independence. And yet it happened. Maybe that's why we're reading this, that they were in denial. Have you ever noticed that even today, the King of England is ostensibly the King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. It's, uh, I don't know what the French and the Irish think of that. Anyway, um, there's another one, one of the most poignant of songs written during the exile by Levitical uh, singers and, and harpists. So it's a goodie. Pretty much shock ending. 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Upon the poplars in the midst of her, we hung up our harps. For there our captors, and the Babylonian troops, demanded of us songs, and our tormentors mirth and entertainment. And sing us some of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the songs of Yahweh in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand fail me, or wither, I may become paralyzed, the hand I would use to strum the lyre. May my tongue cleave to my palate if I do not remember you, if I set not Jerusalem above my highest joy. Well, that is great stuff. I'm not singing those songs. I can't sing them until I get back to the temple uh, and um, can, you know, where you have to have the liturgy. Verse 7, 
Remember, O Yahweh, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem. Uh, the day of defeat. They who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. It's R-A-Z, like a razor, you know. Cut it down. O oh, daughter of Babylon, destructive one, blessed be he who requites to you the treatment that you have dealt out to us. Blessed be he who seizes your little ones and dashes them to pieces upon a rock. Holy Christ. And boy, that, there's the, the horror of, uh, of unbridled hatred that, of course, still goes on. It's nothing compared to the unspeakable depredations the Serbians inflicted on the Bosnians and so on in our own day. Well, um, they're saying, yeah, that's what the Edomites did when they cooperated with our Babylonian conquerors, the bastards. Oh, I wish they'd get the same, the psalmist says, and they will one day pretty rough. Uh, later on, Jews would identify Edom with Rome, and often in uh, Christian era, common era Jewish texts, when they refer to Edom, they mean Rome. Um, and, uh, of course, there were still Edomites around, and they were allies of Rome, as witness Herod, uh, right? He was half Edomite, at least. Uh, so, not the best of friends, and this ethnological complex tries to legitimate first the uh, conquest of Edom by Israel and then adjust it to the uh, successful reassertion of Edomite priority. It's not that the writer likes that idea. It's just that he doesn't want to make a mockery. I should say the interpolator, the editor, the redactor. He just doesn't want the... uh, established story to look ridiculous in light of current events. Oh, yeah, yeah, remember that? Remember they uh, say that uh, Isaac gave the priority to Jacob? I guess not, because it uh, looks like old uh, Edom is on top again. Well, they really had no, no alternative but to say, oh, uh, uh, actually God predicted that too. Oh, yeah, he did? Where? Oh, right here, don't you see? <laughs> sure. That's the deal. Sorry to be so skeptical, but uh, that's what one has to be to uh, understand why the heck there are these contradictions and oddities. You, you see what I mean by that? Why couldn't the guy have said this? I mean, let's assume there is such a thing as clairvoyant predictive prophecy. All right, sure, why not? Uh, still, you, you're given a prophecy, and in the very next breath, you're negating it? Well, look... <laughs> If you already know of a change in plans, it's not even a change in plans. Why did you put it that way? Like Dale Gribble said on an episode of King of the Hill, wait a minute, this change in plan wasn't in the original plan. Yeah, that's it exactly. The change in plan ain't going to be in the original plan. I, by, by definition, that has to be a later alteration. That's just like in the... Uh, in the uh, Olivet Discourse and the Synoptic Gospels, uh, the uh, all these parables attendant to it, that you're going to be on edge waiting for the Son of Man to come, but then you're going to say, what, what is this? Why is he delaying so long? Yeah, I think I'll just relax. Wait a second. <laughs> you can't even raise such a question until the delay has happened. You can't predict the delay in the same breath you give the deadline, right? If you already knew, you'd simply give the later deadline. Or you'd simply say, really, nobody knows. But you can tell then that you've got somebody fiddling with the text, trying to update it. Yeah, well, uh, so, okay, uh, we've um, got trouble of brewing here back at the ranch. And what happens next? Well, we... Um, we have a kind of a replay of uh, the the uh, business with Abraham sending his uh, servant off to find a good Aramean kinswoman to marry Isaac. 
this seems to come out of the middle of nowhere, but uh, in uh, its priestly material, it starts in chapter 27, verse 46. Now, it's an odd place for it to start, you may think, but then you're forgetting the all-important fact that chapter and verse divisions are not in the original. Um, so Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm tired to death of the Hittite women. Remember, you saw a married one. Uh, if Jacob marries a Hittite woman like these, one of the natives of the land, what good will life be to me? Uh, I, I just can't live with these, uh, these smart mouth bitches. Uh, uh, so, 28 1, so Isaac called Jacob and blessing him, gave him this charge. Now, wait a minute, wasn't he hightailing it out of town? Well, this is from P. This is a different uh, story. Uh, it's patched in together here. So Isaac called Jacob and blessing him, gave him this charge. You must not marry any Canaanite woman. Go at once to Paddan Aram, to the home of Bethuel, your mother's father and procure a wife there from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May El Shaddai bless you. Remember, that's one of P's favorite divine names. May El Shaddai bless you and make you prolific and so numerous that you become a company of peoples. May he bestow the blessing vouchsafed to Abraham on you and likewise on your descendants after you that you may take possession of the land in which you are now only an immigrant which God, Elohim, gave to Abraham. Well, what do you know? He not only had an extra blessing in his back pocket to give to Esau, he's got yet another one for the blessing-laden Isaac. Of course, there was no incongruity in the original because the priestly writer was not assuming all that stuff we read out of Jay. This is the blessing of Isaac, and he knows of no other. Well, verse 5 again, P. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Wait a minute. You mean his dad sent him? Didn't it imply his father was dead when uh, uh, Esau began to boast about the soon coming death of his creepy little brother? Uh, and, and his mom sent him away again? different story. I just got to underline that because some people are trying to revive the pre-critical view that it's all one narrative. That's ridiculous. You just can't be reading it if you're thinking that. Okay, verse 6. When Esau discovered that Isaac had blessed Jacob we're still in P and sent him off to Pat and Aram to get a wife there and on blessing him it charged him not to marry any Canaanite woman and that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Pat and Aram. Esau realized that his father Isaac disliked Canaanite women, so he went to Ishmael and married Mahalath, the sounds like a monster in a Joe Studios film, uh, the daughter of Abraham's son Ishmael, the sister of Nebaioth, in addition to the wives that he had those uh, Hittite hussies. Um, so he said, ooh, if I, now why does he care? I mean, he's already married to more than one of these wise-ass uh, hussies uh, that, that his mother can't live with. Well, maybe he's, I'm guessing he's still thinking of the inheritance. Maybe I'm not totally counted out after all, but I will be. Uh, if I bring another one of those into the family, so maybe I'll stick closer to the family tree. Verse 10, here's one little bit of Jay's version of Jacob leaving and uh, um, for parts unknown. Leaving Beersheba, Jacob set out for Haran. Now we've got a little E episode. We have put together here, cheek by jowl, an E story and a J story, two versions of the same story a ceremonial tale about why Bethel is a holy place the name Bethel Beit El the house of El the house of God um, 
it was very famous. That's one of the, the one of the old holy sites where Jeroboam, first king of Israel, once it split from Judah, set up two temples to compete with that of Solomon in Jerusalem. Well, he didn't pick any old place. Uh, he picked the ancient holy sites, and one of them was Bethel. And there are a number of ceremonial stories trying to explain why Bethel was so darn holy and here's a couple of them two versions of the night dream of, um, of Jacob that are put in side by side spliced together we're going to find that there are yet more than that too ok so E this would be 2811 reaching a certain sanctuary he spent the night there for the sun had set. He, you know, why would you do that? Well, they had um, incubation, as they called it. Same word for the eggs, hatching and heat, right? Only what this meant was that you would sleep in or near the temple ground so that in the presence of the God, he might speak to you in a dream. So that's, that's what he does. He sleeps in the sanctuary. And um, he took one of the stones in the sanctuary, and using it for a pillow, he lay down in that sanctuary. And I've had some pretty uncomfortable pillows, but you know, this would have to take the cake. Would he really do that? I don't know what their sleep practices were were about. I mean, you think this would give the poor guy a case of restless scalp syndrome? But uh, at any rate, uh, we need him to do this because. Little does he know that there is a local deity who lives in the sacred pillar that he has uh, put on its side to use as a mere pillow. And uh, so he took one of the stones of the sanctuary that is a standing stone, either a Matseba, sun pillar, or an Asherah, uh, dedicated to the goddess Asherah, and he props his head on it. And I guess if you're going to have less trouble with acid reflux and sleep apnea that way. He had a dream in which he saw a ladder set up on the earth, or if you prefer, a stairway, and the same thing in Hebrew, with its top reaching the sky, and angels of God, or one could translate messengers of God, were ascending and descending on it. Why were they doing that for exercise? Like a hamster in a circular uh, cage? Well, no. They're on errands for God. The ladder or stairway connects heaven and earth. It's the axis mundi that uh, Mercia Eliade talks about. They believe that there was a place where God's messengers came down and entered the world to go far and wide as the Satan does in Job, right? Where have you been all this time? So I'm on my, on my uh, reconnaissance uh, mission. I'm walking to and fro over the earth to check everybody out. Well, yeah, God sends his messengers down the ladder to communicate. He um, sends his messengers down the ladder with messages which they deliver and come back up and so forth. So that's what he sees in this dream because he's right there at the thing. Uh, then we start in with verse 13. The uh, Yahvist, J. Then Yahweh stood over him, or beside him, take your pick, and said, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham and of Isaac. The land on which you are lying I am going to give to you and your descendants. Your descendants shall be like the dust on the ground. You shall spread to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south, so that all races of the earth will invoke blessings on one another through you and your descendants. I will be with you and guard you wherever you go and bring you back to this land for I will never forsake you until I have done what I have promised you. There's another one of those funny things where I know this is out of left field but it's worth pointing out. 
where when it says, I'm not going to do this until so-and-so, it doesn't have any reference to afterward that, where there's going to be a change of plans. <laughs> it can just be the stupidest thing to think that the intent here is, well, I am planning to forsake you after I take care of this item of business and bring you back into the uh, promised land. Again, I'm going to make sure I get you there. Uh, but once you're there, you're on your own. I'm out of here. <laughs> that would just be ludicrous. Now, why am I pointing that out? Well, because of the weird Protestant way of reading uh, this statement in Matthew where it says that, that um, Joseph did not have relations with Mary until the birth of their firstborn. Oh, man, you're supposed to imagine uh, uh, Joseph getting uh, uh, stars in his eyes and bringing roses to Mary and sprinkling uh, Hershey's kisses along the, the path out of the, uh, the kitchen into the bedroom and making bedroom eyes at her. God, no, of course not. That it's merely trying to say during the whole of the relevant period he didn't touch her. Therefore, we know that Jesus must have been miraculously conceived, etc. Right, whether that's true or not, you know, I don't think so. But the point is, that is what, what the evangelist Matthew is saying. And it's the same thing here, right? It's, it's not. Uh, after that, you're on your own. No, don't worry. During this whole projected period, I'm with you. This whole thing, however, is a way of tying these stories into uh, the Exodus. Uh, you're going to get the blessings of Abraham, but I'm going to have to bring you back here because you're all leaving. Sure doesn't explain how. You know, the Jake would have to have been pretty puzzled, but the reader knows about the Exodus. And so he figures, oh, yeah, I get it. You see, this is an attempt to harmonize two traditions, one in which Moses was leading the people as nomads in the Sinai Desert and had no intention of ever coming into to Palestine. Or another one in which he was leading them out of Egypt and Palestine and made it in. Uh, but there are all these competing versions, and so we have to say, well, all right, God is telling the uh, native Israelites of, of Canaan that they can stay there, even though there might be trouble brewing with them too, but we'll jump off that bridge when we come to it. It's a way of harmonizing the different versions. All right, so there's an editorial insertion. Um, you're going to get the land, but uh, technically not after, uh, not until you're, you uh, are exiled to come back. And then uh, Jay continues in verse 16. When Jacob woke from his sleep, he said, Yahweh must surely be in this place, and I did not know it. This place, this rock, this stone, yeah, it could mean that very easily. There were odd shaped rocks. We might pick them up and say it's a lucky rock. They would say a god lives in it. That's why it has an odd shape. This, what an awesome place this is. This can be nothing other than the house of God. And that, the gate of the sky. I get up into the sky, the gate of heaven. Uh, then, uh, the awestruck gate of the sky thing that much is uh, part of the peace summary we go back to J in verse 19 accordingly he called the name of the, that sanctuary Beth El house of El house of God whereas the earlier name of the city had been Luz yeah that's, that's pretty good that. And again, this is why it's holy. This is why, though one could build a temple to Yahweh any place he appeared, well, he appeared to the patriarch Jacob here and more than once. And again, going in, if we go a little further, and one more verse into J, verse 18. So when Jacob rose in the morning, he took the stone which he had used as a pillow and set it up as a sacred pillar. He poiled, oh, sorry, he poured oil on its top. Uh, 
that's how you would consecrate it as, uh, as a matzavah or sun pillar. In verse 20, 20 through 29, 1, our E material, Jacob then made this vow. If Elohim will go with me and watch over me on this journey that I'm making and give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I come safely home to my father's house, then will oh, sorry, then Yahweh shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up as a sacred pillar shall be God's house, and I will give to thee a portion of everything that thou givest me. Jacob then continued his journey and came to the land of the Kedamites. Uh, that would be um, the E material. This is pretty much a similar idea as we already had. Mm. In 20. Nine one we have the very end of the priestly material on this uh, these events. Jacob then continued his journey and came to the land of the Kedemites. Looking around, he saw a well in the open with three flocks of sheep and fl- uh, lying beside it. For it was from this well that the flocks were watered. The stone over the mouth of the wall was so large that it was only after all the shepherds had the stone off the mouth of the wall and a lot of sheep, after which they could replace the stone, after which they could replace the stone over the mouth of the well. Does this ring a bell with you? Yeah, this is a famous type scene. Think of Jesus and a woman at the well in Samaria. Think of. Uh, Abraham and a woman at the well, uh, Jacob, and so on. It's the kind of thing with variations that happens again and again. It kind of one of those things that lets, lets, lets us know we're in the Bible. All right. Um, uh, he uh, addresses them with the. Uh, Yeah, the, the shepherds were score. My friends, where do you come from? Jacob said to them. We come from Haran, I said. Ooh, that's ancestral country, isn't it? Um, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? He said to them. We do, said they. Is he well? He said to them. He is, they said. And here is his daughter, Rachel, coming with his sheep. Why, said he, the day still has long to run. It is not yet time for the livestock to be gathered in. Water the sheep and go on pasturing them. But they said, we cannot until all the shepherds assemble and roll the stone off the mouth of the well so that we can water the sheep. While he was still talking with him, Rachel arrived with her father's flock, for she was a shepherdess. As soon as Jacob saw reach Rachel, the daughter of Laban, um, with, uh, his mother's brother, with the flock of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob went up and rolling the stone off the mouth of the well, watered the. Oops, let's see. Yeah, uh, watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice in weeping. Then Rachel, sorry. Then Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and the son of Rebekah. She ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him, embraced him, kissed him, and brought him home. Jacob then told Laban his whole story, whereupon Laban said to him, You are my very own flesh and blood. So he stayed with him a whole month. And Laban said to Jacob, Should you, just because you were a relative of mine, work for me for nothing? Let me know what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters, the name of the older being Leah, and that of the younger, Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, while Rachel was beautiful. And still is not. Let's see. Weak eyes. What 
was that supposed to mean? I've read various guesses. Uh, uh, Jacob had fallen in love with Rachel, so he said, I will work seven years for you in return for Rachel. He says to Laban, I will work seven years for you in return for Rachel, your younger daughter. Whereupon Laban said, It is better for me to give her to you than to anyone else. Stay with me. So Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him a few days because he loved her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my time is up, and I want to marry her. So Laban gathered all the men of the place and held a feast. But in the course of the, of the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, who married her. Laban gave his slave Zilpah to his daughter Leah as her maid. Next morning, however, Jacob discovered that it was Leah, so he said to Laban, Is this as clear as the law to be? Yeah, th this kind of reminds one of <laughs> this bizarre switcheroo with um, Lot and his daughters, where he is so stone drunk that he's not even aware of his daughters coming in to sleep with him. Well, somehow, <laughs> this switch has happened, uh, and he's uh, he's lame with the wrong gal. Incredible. <laughs> Next morning, uh, Jacob discovered that it was Leah, so he said to Laban, What a way for you to treat me! Did I not work with you for Rachel? Why then if you cheated me? And it is not customary in our country to marry the younger daughter before the older Laban said, eh, finish the week's festivities for this one, wedding reception. And then I'll give you the other also, eh, in return for another seven years' service with me. Ooh. This is E, by the way. Uh, ever since we were in verse 14. Jacob did so. Amazing, he didn't kill the guy. Uh, Jacob did so. He finished her week's festivities, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel in marriage, and to his daughter Rachel, he gave his slave Bilhah as her maid. So he married Rachel also, and besides, he loved Rachel more than Leah. Thus he had to work uh, with Laban another seven years. When Yahweh and Ali got uh, supposedly J material, though it does seem to kind of follow up on what we just read, when Yahweh saw that Leah was slighted, he made her pregnant while Rachel remained barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son. Now, how did he do this? Now, let's just leave that to the imagination, how he impregnated her. Um, but that's kind of saying that he did. Uh, she said, because Yah, they heard that I was slighted. Whoops. I'm sorry, I'm just jumping ahead. Um, so Leah conceived and bore a son whom she named Reuben, which means behold the son. For, she said, Yahweh has taken note of my distress. Now my husband will love me. And the Lord to speak. You know, uh, surveys of women that go into abortion clinics reveal that a great number of them who, by the way, are against abortion, even though they're doing this, they, they're they doing it against their convictions, not from their convictions. But they say they got pregnant and uh, they didn't want to get rid of the pregnancy, but their common-law husband, their boyfriend, whatever, insisted that they do so, and so they're getting bullied into it. Now, why didn't these women take precautions. Why'd they allow themselves to get pregnant uh, in the first place? Well, they say they didn't want to, like Elaine Bennis, carry around birth control with them so that the men they were dating would think that they were whores or something. <laughs> you know they were, right? Uh, uh, they wouldn't sleep with anybody, and uh, but they didn't take precautions because they didn't want the guy to think ill of them. It was a cheap tart. Uh, and uh, and they figured anyway, 
if we have the the kid, that will cement the bum's loyalty to me, and he'll stick with me. Yeah, you better think again, sweetheart. And that's just the opposite of what these lazy, shiftless uh, bums who don't take responsibility do. Well, uh, nice knowing you. Nice knowing you. Goodbye. Uh, and uh, that's just what she's thinking here, right? Oh, he's going to love me now. Are you kidding yourself, lady? It would be good if he did, and some do. But you know the, the score. Um... 33. Again, she conceived and bore a son. So she said, Because Yahweh heard that I was slighted, he, he's given me this one also. And she called his name Simeon or Shimeon, hearing. Again, she conceived and bore a son. This time, she said, My husband will surely become attached to me, seeing that I've borne him three sons. That was how their names came to be called Mike, Robbie, and Chip. No, uh, no, that was how he came to be called Levi, on the theory that that means attachment. But uh, I think we'll see there are other more interesting options for what Levi means. This is interesting because the, um, well... Well, okay, then this hasn't worked. Let's put it that way. My husband will surely become attached to me now that I've born three sons. What, the first two didn't do the trick? Um, afraid not. Well, verse 35, once more she conceived and bore a son, whereupon she said, Now do I praise Yahweh. That was why she called his name Judah, or Yehuda, which means praise. That's a good one, I think. Right? That's very handy. Now, is that where they got these names? It seems unlikely. Um, the various names of the different tribes mean all sorts of things. Some of them denote tribal totems and gods they had once worshipped, still did probably. Or certain topographical features when they were born. But here, they all have to be made the sons of one man for the sake of uh, intertribal solidarity. Then she stopped bearing children. Well, that's J versus um, mid-30 through uh, 35. And um, in the E story to follow here, uh, we uh, have uh, more kids born. 30 verse 1. Then she stepped around mm, bearing children, yes, she stopped bearing children. When Rachel realized that she was not bearing children to Jacob, she became jealous of her sister and said to Jacob, okay, here's another one, right? Not, uh, not bearing the kids first. Said to Jacob, as if it's his fault, mind you, give me children or else I die. Jacob blazed with anger against Rachel and said, can I take the place of Elohim who has kept you from having children? And she said, now, ask yourself if it sounds like an instant replay. Uh, here's my slave, Billa. Have intercourse with her that she may bear children for my knees, uh, and that I too may build up a family through her. So, as soon as the baby was born, it was put on the knees to mommy. Right? Uh, so she gave him her maid, Billa, in marriage, and Jacob had intercourse with her. Billa conceived and bore Jacob a son. Whereupon Rachel said, God, Elohim, brought judgment on me, but now he has heeded my call and given me a son. That was why she called his name Dan. He brought judgment. What is what Dan means? Again, Rachel's maid Bilha conceived and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, It was a clever trick that I played on my sister, and I succeeded too. So she called his name Naphtali, which means trick. Now we switch over to the J story. Uh, again, both these stories are concerned to provide some kind of origins, of, you know, pseudo-fictive origins for the child. So this would be verse 9. 
when Leah discovered that she had stopped bearing children, she took her maid Zilpah and gave her to Jacob in marriage. And two can play at this game. Zilpah, Leah's maid, bore Jacob a son, whereupon Leah said, How lucky. So she called his name Gad, which means luck. Indeed, Gad is the Near Eastern god of good fortune, and this tribe was simply a bunch of worshippers of Gad. Verse 12, Zilpah, Leah's maid, bore Jacob another son. So Leah said, How fortunate I am, for women will certainly call me fortunate. So she called his name Asher. Fortune. Now, forgive me, but I just have to think that has something to do with the goddess Asherah, who sometimes manifested herself as a man, uh, Asher. And uh, I should think that is the origin of that tribal name, the god they worshipped. And verse 14, at the time of the wheat harvest, Reuben went out of the fields where he found some mandrakes which he brought home to his mother Leah. Mm, please give me some of your son's mandrakes, Rachel said to Leah. She said to her, Is the fact that you took away my husband such a trifle that you should want to take away my son's mandrakes as well? Well then, said Rachel, he may lie <laughs> with you tonight uh, in exchange for your son's mandrakes. Woo! A uh, little barter here. So when Jacob came home from the office, uh, from the uh, fields in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come home with me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. Holy mackerel. A mere pawn in the game. Well, back over to the E source now. God gave heed to Leah. Um, so that she conceived and bore a fifth son to Jacob, whereupon Leah said, God has given me my reward for giving my maid to my husband. Well, she didn't think she could conceive. Well, now she has. So she called his name Ishakar, which means reward, or some say burden bearer. And, uh, again, Leah conceived and bore a sixth son to Jacob, and Leah said, God has made me a significant present. My husband will surely stay with me now, for I've borne six sons. You know, if, if that's what you've got to do to keep the guy, you, know, you, you can use some, some marital counseling lady. So she called his name Zebulun, which means abode. I don't know about you, but I suspect it means a little more than that. It might have something to do with the god uh, Zebul, the lord of the house, Baal Zebul. Of course, that, technically, that's all they're saying here, right? Zebulun, abode, a dwelling place. Baal Zebul means Lord of the inhabited earth. And uh, I should think that is what's going on here, too. She afterward bore a daughter who she named, whom she named Dinah. In fact, this woman lived uh, into the 70s. She used to have a TV show, Dinah Show. Oh, what's that? You say that wasn't the same woman, even though she was old enough? Oh, what well, do you know? I guess you'll learn something every day. Uh, would you think there would be a tribe of Dinah as a result of this, That uh, a matriarchal tribe? Mm, there may have been. It wouldn't be that surprising, but what becomes of her? Zip! Zilch! Nada! I know what an interesting thing if there were to be a matriarchal tribe of Israel, but no, she gets lost in the shuffle. Dinah, is there anything fine to be kicked out of the tribes of Israel? Well, you figure out a rhyme for yourself. Okay, now the desperate housewives flips back over to the J source in verse 22. Yes, even though it uses the name Yahweh, uh, Elohim. God also remembered Rachel. God gave heed to her and made her pregnant so that she conceived and bore a son. Whereupon she said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph, um, saying, Oh, I'm sorry, Joseph, which means may he add, saying, May Yahweh give me another son. Now, Joseph is really the superstar in this thing. Uh, let's see. 
God has taken away my reproach. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, it sure should, because that's uh, part of many stories in the Bible where you've got these supposedly barren women who can't have kids, and they pray to God, and an angel appears and, I think, impregnates them. But uh, at least it says, don't worry, you're going to have a kid, and when they do, uh, oh, all heaven breaks loose for the praise and rejoicing, right? And uh, and the woman's reproach is taken away. That is, her friends and neighbors had thought, "Ooh, she can't bear children. What a shame! She must have done something to displease God." None of my business, of course. Don't know what it is. Don't need to know. But she must have done something wrong for God to withhold these blessings from her. Well, you get pregnant. At least you don't have that to deal with anymore, right? They have to say, okay, I guess she's all right. God allowed her to bear children after all. Yeah, that's what uh, the uh, in the way we usually read it in the Gospel of Luke, that the Magnificat Mary is singing. He has taken away my reproach, just like this. But it doesn't actually say Mary, and it's... Uh, the, most recent named speaker for the she to refer back to is Elizabeth. I join those scholars to say that was the way the story originally went. The Magnificat was attributed to uh, to Miriam, the bride of. Uh, wait a minute, what am I? Not not to Miriam, but to Elizabeth, the wife of Zechariah, the mother of John the Baptizer. Okay. So we're we're really having trouble keeping up with all these darn kids, and we're not quite. Uh, wait a minute, is that? Well, we're not quite done. But the last guy shows up again late in the story. The kid brother, Benjamin. We're still in J in verse 25. It was after Rachel had given birth to Jacob, that Jacob said to Laban, Let me go that I may depart from my own home and country. Give me my wives and children for whom I have worked for you that I may go. So you understand how well I have worked for you. But Laban said to him, if I may have your permission to say so, I have learned from the omens that Yahweh has blessed me because of you. Name me your wage, he added, and I will pay it. But he added, I'm sorry, but he said to him, You know yourself how I have worked for you and what your stock has become under my care. He doesn't mean his investments, right? It's tempting. They're not completely stupid to, to almost think that, but he means handling the livestock. And again, you just can't help but think, wait a minute, am I not going to see a scene like this again later when uh, Joseph grows up and becomes the right-hand man of Pharaoh? Yes, you are going to see it. It's of a type scene. Um, so they uh, give him the soil and the planting materials and all that. Um, and uh, Joseph succeeds just like uh, Jacob does here. Yeah. Yeah, it's just something that happened in verse 30. It was... Well, 29, you know yourself how I've worked for you, Jacob said to Laban, and what your stock has become under my care for was little that you had before I came, whereas now it has expanded into a great deal, since Yahweh blessed you upon my arrival. But when am I to make provision for my own household? What should I give you, he said. Give me nothing of the sort, said Jacob. I will go on pasturing and tending your flock if you will do this thing for me. Go through all the flock today and remove from it every speckled and spotted sheep, every one of the lambs that is black, and every one of the goats that is spotted and speckled. Such shall be my pay. And the Lord's just going to have them in the refrigerator so he can eat them any old time and give their meat to his fellow priests and so on. 
He's always not thrilled about giving him the, the squab to eat. It would be. Again, give me nothing of the sort, said Jacob. I will go on pastoring and tending your flock. If you will do, do this for me, go through all the flock today and remove from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every one of the uh, lambs that is black and any of the goats that is spotted and speckled. Such shall be your way. If some future, at some future time, whenever you may come, my bounty. I'm thinking of uh, I'm talking about Freudian slips. I'm thinking of the mandrakes again. My honesty toward you will answer for me in the matter of my hire. If there's anyone among the goats that is not speckled and spotted, or among the lambs that is not black, it came into my possession by theft. So he set up a criterion whereby he'll know exactly what livestock Laban has given him uh, and what he is not, and he'll be safe that way. So that they remove the striped and spotted he goats on the speckled and the spotted she goats. <laughs> Reminds me of the farm report I used to hear every day in Jackson, Mississippi, at one time. Uh, every one with white on it and all the lambs that were black and handing them over to his sons he put a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob while Jacob remained in charge of the rest of Laban's flock and Jacob procured some fresh boughs of poplar almond and plain uh, when uh, yeah and peeled quite greatest <laughs> ice stripes of them uh, thus laying bare the white on the boughs. He then placed the boughs which he had peeled in front of the sheep in the troughs. Now, you're in for some agricultural. Uh, can you top this? Uh, he placed the boughs which he had peeled in front of the sheep in the troughs, that is, the water troughs, where the sheep came to drink. Since they bred when they came to drink, <laughs> you just see this, right? <laughs> The sheep are coming to the bar for a drink. Hey, sweetheart, what's a nice you like you doing in a place like this? And so they sneak off and mate. Uh, since they, yeah, they bred when they came to drink, the sheep bred among the boughs, and so had lambs that were striped, speckled, and spotted. Now, wait just a minute. Uh, well, this is clearly, <laughs> this is clearly in a day of magic. Right there. It's like, you know, how come you're. Uh, so uh, sensitive when your mother hear a firecracker when she was pregnant with you. Well, these, uh, <laughs> these are born with these markings because they were conceived in the presence of uh, these <laughs> these sticks with the same markings. Uh, the Bible anticipates modern science once again. Uh, um, don't you love the Bible? I mean. I'd rather riot. Uh, I'd rather laugh at it or with it or whatever I'm doing than than to try to pretend that it all oh, else it's all in there and the word of God. Uh, um, he put his own flock off by themselves and did not add them to Laban's flock. Whenever the hardier ewes were breeding, Jacob used to put the boughs and the troughs in front of the uh, uh, flock so that they might breed among the boughs, but not in the case of the weaker ones. As the weaker ones fell to Laban and the hardier to Jacob. The man accordingly grew richer and richer and had large flocks, as well as male and female slaves, camels, and asses. Now, Jacob, verse, uh, chapter 31, we're still in J, uh, verse 1. Now, Jacob heard Laban's son say, Jacob has taken all that our father had. It is out of what our father had that he has acquired all this wealth. Jacob saw, too, that the attitude of Laban toward him was not what it used to be. So Yahweh said to Jacob, Return to the land of your father, and to your relatives. I will be with you. Uh, so things are getting kind of hot, and uh, God uh, can't seem to change their minds. He says, Now, here, here's your signal to go back home. Uh, God is more deftly weaving the tapestry here. So he's not going to overrule things. And then we jump back into 
J as a verse 4. So Jacob sent for Rachel and Leah to come to his flock in the fields and said to them, I see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it used to be. However, the God of my father is with me. You know yourselves that I have worked for your father to the best of my ability. Where is your father? has cheated me. And has changed my wages ten times. Ten times? Well, this is what's called a paralepsis. Uh, this is a supplying of information hitherto missing but which we would not know had been missing until it had been filled in. I mean, we knew the guy was kind of shifty, not treating him right, but he changed his wages ten times. And boy, what an uncle. Why don't you have Uncle Leo on Seinfeld? Um, yeah, uh, verse uh, middle of seven. But God has not allowed the, him to do me any harm whenever he said... The speckled animals that would be your wage, then all the sheep and speckled lambs. And whenever he said, okay, the striped animals that would be your wage, all the sheep had striped lambs. Thus God has taken away your father's flock and given it to me. So, you see what he's saying here? Hey, look, I did not poach your dad, my father-in-law's flock here. This is simply a matter of breeding. It was, uh, uh, it turns out, uh, this is the way they were born. It's not as if he had nothing to do with it, but he's breeding them to come out the right way. He's not, he's not stealing uh, the, the critters. That's his point. Oh, and he continues, verse 10, Once when the sheep were breeding, I had a dream, and raising my eyes, I saw that the rams were leaping on, the, the rams that were leaping on the goats were striped, speckled, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, here I am, said I, whereupon he said, Raise your eyes and look. All the rams that are leaping on the goats are striped, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God who appeared to you at Bethel, where you anointed a sacred pillar and made a vow to me. Come then, leave this land and return to the land of your birth. Well, well. Um, how far shall we... Yeah, I guess we we got time to try to round off a bit more of this and see what finally happens in the great biblical soap opera. All right. Uh, in response, Leah, uh, Rachel and Leah said to him, Is there any share or heritage left to us in our father's house? Are we not considered foreigners by him? So this is, this is a rhetorical question. You know, why not? Yeah, we got nothing here. For he sold us and has enjoyed the use of, how do you like this word, the use of fruit. You don't hear that one very often anymore, of our dowry as well. In other words, uh, uh, the dowry was what the suitor had to pay of uh, the uh, his potential father-in-law, and in this case it was 14 stinking years of hard labor. Uh, so he's benefited from that. Uh, our, uh, I'm sorry, all the property which God has taken from our father really belongs to us and our children. So do just what God has told you to do. I'm saying this to Jacob, of course. So Jacob proceeded to what mount his sons and wives on camels and drove off all his stock, all the livestock which he had acquired, his accumulated stock, which he had acquired in Pad and Aram, to go home to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. By the way, we have been in E again ever since 31-4. Um, when what? Verse 19 now. When Laban was away, shearing his sheep, Rachel stole the household gods that belonged to her father. And Jacob outwitted Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he was going to flee. So he fled with all that belonged to him. Starting forth, he crossed the river and set his face toward the, the, high, yeah, the highlands of Gilead. Three days later, Laban was told that Jacob had fled, so he took his tri fellow tribesmen with him and pursued him for seven days, overtaking him in the highlands of Gilead. But God had come to Laban the Aramean in a dream one night and had said to him, Take care to say nothing to Jacob, either good or bad. So when Laban came up 
uh, with Jacob, Jacob having pitched his tent on Mount Mizpah, and Laban having Laban having encamped with his fellow tribesmen on Mount Gilead, Laban said to Jacob, What do you mean by outwitting me and carrying off my daughters like prisoners of war? Why did you flee in secret without telling me and rob me? I would have sent you off with myrrh and songs, with tambourine and lyre. You did not even allow me to kiss my grandsons and daughters goodbye. How foolishly you have acted. I had it in my power to do you harm, but the God of your father said to me the other night, Take care to say nothing to Jacob, either good or bad. So now you are off, because of course you long for your father's home. But why did you steal my gods? What are they? What's he talking about? That, uh, Of course, uh, we were told that um, Rachel swiped him in verse 19. Household gods? Yeah, we read about this later in a David story, the so-called teraphim. And some have pointed out that that seems to be another version of rephaim, the shades of the dead, implying that they had little uh, statues in the house representing dead ancestors. Uh, that it was a kind of a relic of ancestor worship or ancestor veneration. They, all, uh, they are called gods, after all. For instance, in yet another story where Saul is seeking out the ghost of Samuel to tell him his future desperately. Great, great story. Poor Saul has uh, outlawed spirit mediums, channelers, whatever you want to call them. But now he's, he needs one to call up the ghost of the seer Samuel. But the poor jerk knows that uh, the, uh, the only ones that are left are worried about him because he closed them all down. So he has to go to one that somebody finds for him wearing a disguise. He said, I want you to bring up a prophet, uh, Samuel. Uh, Samuel, who would want business with... Uh, you wouldn't be from the king, would you? Some sort of a narc? And he said, no, no, don't worry about it. Just get Samson for me. So she goes into the trance and sees him coming up from under the earth and says, Behold, I see a God coming up out of the earth. Yeah. And it's, Sam, it's Samuel, all right. And he, oh, I love this one. Right? He says to him, Why have you disturbed my rest? He says, Well, I've got to know. i got a battle coming up tomorrow and, uh, and Yahweh won't speak to me through any of the prescribed methods, uh, the prophets, the oracles, the Urim and Thummim. So I've resorted to this. Tell me, you're wasting your time and mine. Tomorrow, you're going to be down here with me. We can talk all we want then. Whoa! Sure enough, he dies the next day in battle. But, but this is the same idea that uh, the dear departed are gods in some manner. I mean, small g gods, I suppose, but uh, divine beings who can be consulted through oracles. The ghosts are a kind of god, and so one might want to consult them. After all, they're down in Sheol. They know things in the spirit world, just as the jinn or the demons do. And so people have teraphim, or statues of the dead, um, like on the mantle, so to speak. Probably little clay uh, statuettes. And, um, and so uh, she's ripped them off. Uh, Jacob doesn't know that, but Laban does. And so what, what are you doing? You know, you're taking... My gods, well, of course, they're equally those of his own descendants if they're ancestral, but he still wants them around to make use of them, apparently. Okay, um, why'd you steal my gods? 31, in reply, Jacob said to Laban, I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. The one in whose possession you find your gods shall not live in the presence of our tribesmen identify whatever is yours among my belongings and take it Jacob did not know that Ra Rachel had stolen them right? he's so sure that ah, I can steal a damn thing I uh, just realize his wife did and he said if anybody took anything let him be executed <laughs> oops uh, so what's going to happen here? Well, 33, so Laban went into the tent of Jacob, the tent of Leah, and that of the two maids found nothing. Leaving Leah's tent, he went into Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and putting them in the camel's saddle and sat down on them. The camel's saddle is a sort of big affair, and uh, it's 
a, an arched thing in the, the middle. I know a guy that uses one as a footstool. Put him in the camel saddle and had sat down on him. When Laban had felt all over the tent without finding anything, uh, why would he do that? Well, because they had carpeting on the, the sand floor. They would have huge uh, rugs that would make the floor as well as spread out over you in the ceiling. And so if you wanted to hide something, you could have hidden it under the floor, so to speak, under the, uh, the great uh, carpeting. So you had to feel around for it. You've done the same thing looking for the remote control under your bed covers. Uh, so when Laban had felt all over the tent without finding anything, he, she said to her father, Let not my lord be angry that I cannot rise in your presence, for the uh, ailment common to women is on me. So he searched thoroughly, but did not find the household gods. Then Jacob grew, because she's sitting on him, right? And she's lying. Oh, Jim, I got my period. Don't don't ask me to get up. Uh, you little minx. Uh, then Jacob grew angry and took Laban to task. Jacob spoke up and said to Laban, What's my offense? What is my misdeed that you should have come raging after me and have felt all through my goods? Whatever goods you have found belonging to your house, sent out here in the sight of my tribesmen and yours, that they may decide the issue between us two. For the past twenty years I've been with you. Your ewes and she-goats have never miscarried, and I've never eaten the rams of your flock. I never reported to you the animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself. You held me responsible for anything stolen by day or night. It was not my lot to have the heat wear me out in the daytime and the cold at night and to lose my sleep. For twenty years now I've been a member of your household. I worked fourteen years for you for your two daughters and six years for your sheep. Ten times you've changed my wages, and if the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the God, the awe of Isaac, the RSV translates the fear of Isaac, had not been on my side, you would now have sent me away empty-handed. Uh, those are all gods of the fathers. It implies that the fear of Isaac is not the same as the gods of Abraham and, uh, and Isaac. Uh, God saw my suffering and the fruits of my toil, and he has just recently set it right. In reply, Laban said to Jacob, uh, The girls are my daughters, the children are my grandchildren, the flocks are my flocks. Indeed, everything that you see is mine. But what can I do now about these daughters of mine or the children that they've born? Come then, let us make a covenant, you and me, and let Yahweh be witness between us. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a sacred pillar. Jacob said to his men, gather stones. Now then, this, this is a brief bit of a J version of the same thing. Verse 46, Jacob said to his men, gather stones. So they procured stones and made a carn. Then uh, they had a meal there beside the carn. Uh, then we're back at verse 47 with E continuing from 45, which was E. Jacob took a stone and set it up as a sacred pillar. Laban called it, let's see if you can say this right, Jigar Sadadutha, Aramaic for carn of witness. While Jacob called it Galid. Hebrew for carn of witness. This carn, said Jacob, is a witness between you and me today. That's E. Now we go back to J. That was how it came to be named Galid, out of the sacred pillar. Uh, but is that right? That is how it came to be named Galid. Of the sacred pillar, he said. May Yahweh keep watch between you and me when we are out of one another's sight. If you will treat my daughters or marry other wives beside my daughters, although there may be no man to watch us, 
Remember that Elohim is witness between you and me. That's, that's Laban saying this to him. Uh, <laughs> this passage is often printed in religious greeting cards, especially friendship ones, uh, or, or haven't seen you in a long time, or thinking of you greeting cards. Uh, let me just read it again. May Yahweh, or may the Lord, keep watch between you and me when we're out of one another's sight. Well, <laughs> that's not providence. Like, you, I can't see you fooling around, cheating me, but think twice before you do, you SOB, because God will see to it and avenge me. And uh, likewise, if I cheat you, God's going to know it. So he will take the vengeance you would have taken had you seen it. So, okay, we've got a standoff here. We're not going to be able to catch up and check up on each other, but we've invoked God, or even the gods, to do it. The God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the God of uh, the fear of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The fascinating. Okay, then we go back to E. Further, Laban said to Jacob, See, this carn and the sacred pillar which I have erected stand between you and me. This carn is a witness, and the sacred pillar a witness that I will not pass this carn to harm you, and that you will not pass this carn and sacred pillar to harm me. May the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the gods of their ancestors, be judged between us. So Jacob swore to it by the awe of his father Isaac. Jacob then offered a sacrifice on the hill and invited his relatives to partake of the meal. They did so and then spent the night on the hill. The next morning Laban rose early and after kissing his grandchildren and his daughters and given, giving them his blessing, he left and went home. While Jacob resumed his journey. Then the angels of... Well, yeah, all right, uh... Here's a strange little fragment. Then the angels of Elohim, is 32 1. The angels of Elohim encountered him, and as soon as he saw them, Jacob said, This is God's camp. And so called the name of that place Mahanaim, camps. God's camp? Well, remember, Yahweh Sabaot. Yahweh of the hosts, the heavenly armies, the stars of the sky were his angels. Well, just as Jacob before felt that he had stumbled upon the very gateway to heaven where Yahweh lives, and even seen his messengers at work, here he sees the battle camp, the bivouac of the, uh, the troops of God Almighty. Uh, and uh, he, he didn't... Uh, so this is a... Uh, um, a dream? Uh, it doesn't say so, but I'm kind of guessing it is. We have a truncated passage here. Anyway, you cut it. Just a fragment of what must have been an interesting larger thing. There's no real outcome on this later. This would fit better, in fact, way later in the Deuteronomic history. Uh, when, uh, I believe it's Elisha, is outside of Jerusalem with an impending siege by a bunch of heathen. And his servant, his, uh, his attendant, says, Oh, man, we're in for it. And uh, Elisha said, he prays, says, Oh, Yahweh, open the eyes of your servant. And suddenly the, the guy sees that the hills are covered with hitherto invisible angelic warriors who are going to kick the butts of the heathen the next day. Uh, and uh, so that's the idea uh, here, too. But we don't have the rest of the story. It would be real interesting to know who the heck they're going to fight. So this, again, this is not a stupid story. It's not bad storytelling. It's just that the compilers didn't have everything. They just had bits and pieces in some cases and just decided to squeeze them in where they could or... Alternatively, it might be that there was some major battle scene that's been cut. There's, there's no way to know, but that appears to be the beginning of one. And it's just what they call a torso here. Most of it's been removed. But that's better than nothing. It's interesting to get any kind of hint we can of what these ancient stories uh, would have said. 
Uh, now, remember, this was E material from 51 to chapter 32 through verse 2. And you can tell it is because it's a doublet of what we just saw in J, namely the heap of stones, the karn, and what it stands for. We seem to have a lot of repetition, um, and uh, it's because uh, each epic, J and E, had its own version of it. Uh, we, uh, I think we can... Let's see, am I right that we have... Uh, this next, uh, yeah, I believe I'm going to call it uh, quits here for today because we're going to see the aftermath of this uh, Jacob versus Israel conflict that was building, uh, the thing that uh, Jacob had hoped to forestall by leaving the country for you know, 20 years as it turned out to give his brother time to cool down but now he's going to hear that his brother is coming to see him which he thinks means it's coming to kill him uh, and he's, he's uh, panicking figuring oh my gosh I don't just have myself to worry about anymore I got this huge uh, uh, entourage of four wives and all these sons and uh, uh, daughter and, and loads of uh, retainers and slaves and livestock. What the heck's going to happen here? In fact, you wonder if the camp of Yahweh uh, was actually going to erupt into heavenly troops defending them against uh, the, the Edomites, the uh, equally big hosts of his brother after 20 years, but it doesn't come out that way. Uh, in fact, the, the uh, way they avoid a conflict is absolutely fascinating and a masterful piece of storytelling. I don't want to cram it all in, and instead what I would like to do in the last few minutes is to just pick back up with uh, this business about the, um, the holiness of Bethel. Uh, I just want to mention that there are other stories that have much the same point uh, this, uh, there's one in Genesis uh, ooh, am I, uh, I think I've got this open to the 32 well, yeah, yeah, depending on where you locate this the thing about God's camp which he then calls Mahanaim uh, some say that is the same as Bethel or near enough to it that this is yet another version of uh, him seeing the, this contact point with the divine realm and the angels of God I, that sounds right to me so that that was yet another doublet of it we had two spliced together cheek by jowl um, and uh this issues eventually in the uh, the uh, fight between Jacob and an angel, which would kind of make it sacred also, but let's skip that until next time and just jump over to 35, 1 through 15 quickly, which is kind of extra stuff. I know this is jumping around a bit, but I'd like to do it topically, and uh, this seems to be a good place for it. E material again, 35, 1. Then Elohim said to Jacob, Rise, go up to Bethel to live and construct an altar there to Elohim who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods that are in your midst. Purify yourself and change your garments. Then we shall set out and go up to Bethel where I am to construct an altar to Elohim who answered me at the time of my distress and has accompanied me wherever I have gone. So they handed over to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had, as well as rings that were in their ears. And Jacob buried them at the foot of the terebinth near Shechem. And why would he do that? Well, remember the sacred groves of trees signified that gods lived there. That's why you would go there seeking your fortune to be told, etc. Well, here, these goodies are buried there as an offering to the, the gods who live there. 
verse 5, Then they set out, and so great was the terror of God on the cities around them that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob and all the people that were with him reached Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, and there he built an altar calling the sanctuary El Beit El, or El Bethel, because it was there that Elohim had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. What do you mean a parallel? Isn't that simply a kind of a sequel? Well, yeah, but, but uh, it, it is a, a, a doublet in the sense that it issues as one of the others did in his consecrating the place this time with an altar not just a crummy sun pillar I guess that's the point but it's this is the point is that these stories will be told to you as a pilgrim to the temple of Jeroboam in Bethel when people would say well why here you know, what is holy about this spot I said well Jacob used to come here and there would be several different stories reinforcing one another and this is uh, one of them So it's called Beit El, House of Elohim at one point, and now the God of the House of God. That implies it's been known as Bethel for quite some time. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, we have yet another one, though. Cheek by jowl with this. Again, E material. Uh, in verse 8, picking right up, when Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, she was buried below Bethel at the foot of the oak. So it came to be named Oak of Weeping, or in Hebrew, Alun Bakhof. Uh, what's the deal there? Uh, and that's it, right? That's all. One lousy verse. It goes on uh, on a different subject in verse 9. Why bother with that? And who the heck was Deborah anyway? Well, that is, she was a local favorite saint whom women would come to. She, she had like a side chapel, a side uh, uh, sacred tree, the Oak of Weeping. It was a mourning place because she was buried there and she was considered almost one of the mothers of Israel, one of the nurses. She was dead and so they figured, well, she must have been a holy woman. Uh, if, if we want motherly or wifely advice, let's go and get the priest to summon up her shade from Sheol to give us advice or to predict whether our daughters are going to get married, stuff like that. Well, they're telling you here, yeah, that's it. That's what you do there. That's where you find it. That's why it's here at all, because he was gathering material like the Brothers Grimm did in the German countryside to preserve all of this rapidly fading memory of these ancient pieces of lore. So a sacred oak uh, with a deified saint. The, the very kind of thing Isaiah and Amos and Hosea were thundering against because it seemed to them to be polytheistic paganism. Here is the pro side of that uh, debate. Uh, here's another piece of it. Um, the very next verse on his journey from Paddan Aram. God, Elohim, again appeared to Jacob and blessed him. Elohim said to him, Your name has been Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel is to be your name. So he came to be named Israel. Now to let the cat out of the bag, in the great Jacob versus the angel story, there was another version of his name being changed. And oddly enough, it doesn't take either time because they continue to call him Jacob. Well, that's an attempt to fuse him with some other character. I to say I really do the same guy. All right, so there's that name change. In verse 11. Further, Elohim said to him, I am El... Now we're in, in P. Uh, I am El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, or rather a company of nations, shall come from you. And kings shall spring from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac... I will give to you and to your descendants after you. I will give it. Okay, thematically, 
the editor thought it best to follow that up with a little patch from Jay. Elohim there left him at the place where he spoke with him, whereupon Jacob erected a pillar, as I should say, a sacred pillar, a matzibah, at the place where he spoke with him, a pillar of stone, poured a libation on it, and anointed it with oil. So Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. What? Didn't we hear like two times already that the place had been newly named Bethel? And in one of those, didn't we hear they did the same darn thing and set up a pillar and anointed it and called the name of the place? Well, yeah, this is another version of the same thing. They just didn't want to leave out anybody's favorite. Which is why it's you know, so uh, wordy and why it's so repetitive. But that's good. Right? It's a good thing. We don't want any lousy Reader's Digest Bible, such as they put out a couple of decades ago. No, that's a terrible thing. If you're really a student of the Bible, you want to see all the different versions and how they compare and why they're different and so on. Uh, so we've got a bunch of different stories, as you would expect.